let us pray and ask the Lord to uh, bless our study of his word together and that God would really speak uh, to us in a way that we need to hear uh, his encouragement, his challenges, and he, his uh, will so that we we know what to do. So let us pray and ask the Lord for uh, the blessing on the preaching. Father God, we come to you and we thank you again for this opportunity that we can come together and we can study your word. We know that you speak to us through your word. And as we come together, we are coming together in that expectation of hearing from you and learning from your word. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you and we bless all of us whether online or in church, that you would capture our attention. And Lord, break all the maybe blinders that we may have and reveal to us who you are through your word. For this in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning for you guys, I'm going to talk to you from the book of Judges. Uh, Book of Judges, starting at uh, chapter 17 and going all the way back to, all the way to chapter 21. So those are seven uh, long chapters. I have never preached in the sense of seven chapters in one setting, but today we're going to look at uh, those seven chapters. And uh, I will promise you that I will let you out of there on time. Uh, And so uh, seven chapters starting at Uh, chapter 17 and going all the way to chapter 21. Let me just give you a quick uh, background to the book of Judges. The book of Judges deals with uh, the situation time where Israelites uh, did not have kings yet. And Joshua had just taken them to the promised land. And they are in the midst of kind of like a transitional period of time. Joshua is gone, and people are kind of left without a leader. And in that sense, in that time, uh, there are a lot of things that go wrong, right? There are uh, um, evil uh, in in the sense of exceedingly growing. Uh, There are enemies coming from all different angles and attacking uh, God's people. And in the midst of that, God brings uh, these uh, judges. And they deliver Israelites from different kinds of bondage. And so in the book of Judges, there's a, there's a cycle of sin. They will do something horrible. They will do something uh, that God is not pleased with. And then God will bring judgment upon them. And it's interesting that God actually raises enemies to punish Israelites so that God can accomplish what he wants to accomplish through his people. And so there is punishment. And uh, as soon as the punishments come, uh, uh, they repent. And after that, God uh, brings them salvation uh, and gives, uh, brings them freedom, right? So this kind of cycle goes on and on and on for a long time. And then we come to, again, chapter 17, and I'm going to uh, show you what I'm going to share this morning. But God's people, God's people fail to look to the ultimate leader, Jehovah, so everything fails. And this is the great lesson I think I can I see from uh, the book of Judges. So many leaders before them, Moses, Joshua, and there's a vacancy there, and then people be, uh, become uh, uh, much different when there are no godly leaders to lead them through, right? And so this is what is the focus of my message for you this morning, and we're going to look at these verses in a little bit of detail. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.6, 1 Corinthians 10.6 and 10.11, it says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. New Testament tells us the stories and events and things that are written in the Old Testament are for us to read them, for us to look at them and understand what happened in their lives and make sure 
those things are warnings for us. In verse 11 of the same chapter, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. So as we study the Old Testament passage, my goal is again to set our hearts not on evil things and then warn the warnings that God gives to us. I hope we're going to we're going to heed them and listen to what God has for us. Judges chapter 17, verse 6. I will read a couple of verses uh, as an introduction to our sermon. Judges 17, verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Again, in Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So we're told that in those days, there was no king. That this simply means no authority, no one to obey. As a result, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. People ignored all the rules and boundaries set by God. And every man was defining rightness by his own measure. Right is what I say it is. That really reminds us of the time we live in today, right? As I was listening to uh, your prayers, prayer requests, as I was listening to different people speak, I could sense that all of us are kind of concerned. Concerned for our kids, concerned for our church, concerned for our church leaders. And we live in this era where... I define what right is, and I do what I feel is the right thing to do. And so this is nothing new, right? This is nothing new when God is neglected, when God is left behind. The only person that decides what you want is you. In Judges chapter 2, verse 11, we're told, and, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. In chapter 3, verse 12, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 18 says, And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers. Proverbs 12, verse 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto the counsel is wise. Again, Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so when we live in this era, in this uh, thinking pattern that we have that I am in charge and I am going to do whatever I want to do. We can see the folly of that kind of living, even in these verses that I just read you, read to you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 or 5 through 7. Uh, I saw that on the screen earlier. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And so we are told over and over and over that we are not to trust our own feelings, our own ideas, our own wants and desires. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. And beyond cure, who can understand it? Who can trust it? Our heart is deceitful, sinful. And even sometimes when we honestly and sincerely think that we're doing what is right, because of our heart is deceitful and evil, things that we say and do could be wrong in the sight of God. And so we're not to trust 
our mental, uh, whatever games we play or whatever we see outside and hear outside and what the world is preaching to us. And so in order to be safe and protected from all this happening, Book of Judges is a good, good book to read. I know there are so many things that are hard for us to even read, right? Even today, some, some of the chapters that I'm going to cover, I'm not going to read anything because it's so difficult for us to read. But uh, Book of Judges seem to represent our time where, where we are living today. So let's look at uh, the idea that in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And and the first time this is mentioned is in Judges chapter 17, verse 6. And then the second time, this same verse is mentioned in chapter 21 at the end of the uh, chapter. So between 17 and 21, these two verses seem to show us there are three consequences of every man doing what is right in his own eyes. There are three big, huge problems that has come up or that Israelites faced because of this kind of thinking. There was no king and every man that did that which was right in his own eyes. They decided what is, what is right in their own eyes and they did it and there were many problems because of that. So we're going to look at those problems, three of them. Number one, number one is the perversion of the true worship of God. Perversion of the true worship of God. In Judges chapter 17, now just like I said, I'm not going to read all these chapters. Uh, I hope when you go home uh, or in your family reading time, I hope you can read these chapters on your own. But the first problem is the perversion of the true worship. What happens in Judges 17 is that there is a uh, man named Micah. Micah returns 1,100 shekels of sil silver that he had stolen from his mom. And mom had cursed him and mo mom had cursed the person who stole it. And so here, Micah says, finally decides to return that silver to mom. And mom kind of praises him for doing what he did. Uh, that may be also a little bit of a reminder to us what kind of mothers he might have been, right? Her son steals from her. And then there's praises for uh, what he does next. And so mom and the son, they seem to be very far from God. So mom tells Micah to make a graven image or idol out of that silver. And she says it is for the Lord. Now remember, the first perversion is the perversion of true worship. They're doing whatever they want to do. They want to do what they want to do. They want to do what they think is the right thing to do. And the mom says, we're doing this for the Lord. The intention here isn't actually wrong. All the process and methods that they go through are against God, contrary to his standards and his teachings. So Micah makes a shrine for all these idols. He makes ephod and teraphim, similar to what Aaron had made. He's getting ready to do something crazy that the Bible would never support or God would never support. And so he says, well, one of my sons, you can be a priest. I have everything we need. We have uh, the idols. We have uh, ephod. And we uh, uh, can worship God. God will be pleased. And so he ordains one of his sons to be a priest. Now we know you had to be a Levite in order to be a priest. So first mentioned in chapter 17, verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Is mentioned right in the midst of this story. A Levite from Bethlehem, Judah, travels to Ephraim, and he comes to Micah's house, and he wants to stay there for the night or something, and he finds out that Micah has all these idols and they're worshiping God apparently through that. And, and Micah says to this Levite in chapter 17, verse 13, 
now I know they, they talk about it and then they want to have Micah wants this Levite to be a new priest for his family. And so he says, I'll pay you. I'll uh, take care of you. And that Levite says, okay, I will work for you and I will be your priest. And in verse uh, 13 of chapter 17, Micah says, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. See, in the whole process, these people that are involved in there are thinking that they are worshiping God, right? They're thinking that they're pleasing God and they, they're thinking that God would bless them for their effort. But ultimately, we know that is not what God wanted to happen. And so the story goes on in uh, chapter 18, uh, that verse 30 says, And the children of Dan, now one of the tribes uh, from uh, Dan, uh, they had not gotten their land yet. When Joshua divided the uh, land to different tribes, uh, Danites had not gotten theirs. And so they're in search for their land, and they come to where Micah is, and uh, uh, they see what's happening with Micah. He has a Levite. Uh, please go back and read the story. It's a wonderful story. And so Dan, uh, the tribe of Dan, uh, they want not only land, but they want to take uh, Micah's idols and the Levite. And later when they uh, come back after their victory with the battle against uh, the land that they were wanting to get for themselves, they come to the house of Micah and they steal basically all of the graven images and they, the, they took a Levite with them and started worshiping God in a different place. And so the Bible says in chapter 18, verse 30, and the children of Dan set up the graven image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, you know, God punished Israelites and took them to a foreign land by their conquerors. They were worshiping this something that was so much against God, and yet it had gone on for so long. Verse 31, we're told in verse chapter 18, and they set them up, Micah's graven image, which he made, all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. This verse really gives us what is happening there. There was the house of God in Shiloh. That's where uh, Israelites and the people were going there to worship God. That is where God had uh, appointed that place. And that is where the worship of God was happening properly. So here we see the tribe of Dan, they have a, let's say a temple or a place to worship these idols while the house of God in Silo. And Silo was about 19 miles uh, um, uh, away from Jerusalem. Uh, and so there, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, where Danites were, there the real worship was to happen, but these people had created their own ways of worshiping. And so carving of images for worship, Bible says not allowed. Ordaining personal priests, they're not biblical. Worship that replaced the house of God in Shiloh was not acceptable. And so very, very problematic for churches today, for believers all over the world today. And that is God can be used in a way that our worship is not proper. That our worship may be not going anywhere above the ceiling of our fellowship halls or our, our houses. When there is this predominant view amongst God's people that what they want to do is better than what God has prescribed, and then we, we begin to play with it. We begin to change things here and there. Little change won't hurt us. 
somebody might say. Well, do we live in this world that is not the same like, you know, 50, 60 years ago? Things have changed. A little earlier, one of you prayed that sometimes we're pressured to change according to the culture of this world. And we may say the little thing doesn't matter, right? And so those things begin to take over the very valuable, the most valuable aspect of our faith. And that is the true worship of God. And so when there is infighting amongst church people or amongst our leaders or, or, or you know, different churches, right? I, I've read so many uh, things on our news these days that the churches are losing people. Denominations are getting smaller. Our church buildings are turning into other temples or mosques. And I worry that if we let that slide and if we get on that hill that takes us away from God, our end is not going to be a prosperous God's people serving him and rejoicing in him. One of the things that I've seen uh, COVID-19 do to many of the churches, uh, that churches were dying or churches that had lots of problems, God has used COVID maybe, I think, to punish many, many Christian churches today. The doors are closed. People are not coming back to churches. We started worshiping uh, um, uh, online, and online is a big problem for me because church is never online church, right? Church is a fellowship of believers coming together. And so in the midst of all that, what ends up happening? We think that it is better not to meet because people might get sick. It is better not to see, and then all of a sudden, we begin to do things that we've never done. And uh, uh, even in our church here in uh, Thailand, uh, we had our live service today, and I, I would say more than half of them were not there. And I understand, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me, I understand there is a genuine fear uh, of maybe getting sick and, you know, we can't force people. No, those who come to church are not any better than those who stay home and uh, uh, meet with God in, through Zoom. I'm not trying to say one is better than the other. But at the same time, if we are driven by fear of what the society is saying to us and then we fall for it and we are gripped with the aspect of dying, we as Christians, we should never be scared of dying, right? That doesn't mean that we go jump off the bridge or something, but at the same time, we take care of ourselves. We are wise about it. But when God says, Sham, your time is over, it's going to be over. I don't have to have any diseases. I don't have to, you know, go through very, very strange, adventurous things to die. When God says your time is over, it is over. You cannot do anything about it. And so living in these kinds of pressurized time and changing the way we do things for God is very troubling for me. And I'm just being uh, uh, kind of open-minded about what's happening around me and what I, what I see happening around the churches today. So every man did what was right in his own eyes. The very first thing that was affected was it brought a perversion of true worship of God. And so today, our churches, your church, as you think about it, are you doing everything that the scriptures allows you to do in the church? Are you sure that the scriptures clearly teach the kind of practices uh, you have? And just sitting and watching and enjoying uh, the, what you are doing, I was blessed. Everything is very you know, centered around God. Everything that's said is to bring glory and honor to God. And that is wonderful. That is wonderful uh, uh, for me to witness that this morning with you. And so, but many churches and even our church leaders, I think that's part of my sermon for you today, not to take these things for granted. Don't let a simple thing or, or a small thing creep into the church by the church leaders, thinking that these things are true worship of God, maybe they're not. And they may be 
they you may see it as something very spiritual but if it's not in the scriptures it is not if it's not what god teaches us those things cannot be welcomed in our church so here's the first consequence first consequence is the distortion of true worship of god and so let's look at the second one second perversion or distortion is what i call the sexual distortion or distortion of sexuality in chapter 19 <clears throat> there's a horrible story no one wants to read stories like that 19 20 21 the last three chapters are very very disturbing in that day everyone did whatever was right in their own eyes and we see the sexual revolution come, sexual distortion come, sexual sins that are present in that chapter is just too crazy for me. In chapter 19, I'm just going to read a couple of verses from there. In chapter 19, verse 12, starting at verse 12, and his master said to him, and again, go, please go back and read this story, okay? So here's a, a man and he has a concubine. And um, uh, concubine is, is gone back to uh, her parents, maybe. Uh, and he wants to go get her back. And, and there's a long story. But finally, he convinces that it's time for him to take his concubine with him and return back to his home. And as he is returning back, he doesn't want to stop at uh, villages or towns uh, that are not Israelites. Because he doesn't trust them. Maybe they won't be nice to him, and maybe uh, he fears them. So he looks for his own kind, Israelites, maybe one of the tribes. So he comes to a place where uh, a Benjamite, Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin, was living. And he thinks that it's his home, his people. And you know the story there, if you have read. In chapter 19, verse 12, and his master said to him, we will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his young man, come and let us draw near to one of these places, spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on to and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah and which belongs to Benjamin. And so as they are invited in, the people in the town there, village, they come out in verse 15, bring out that man who came into your house that we may know him. And so horrible things take place after that. This is supposedly one of the tribes of Israel. This is where he thought that he had a safe place. And this place was in a mess. There was no king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so people of God's people were accommodating to things that are not permitted by God's word. And sins that were so deadly. God hates these kinds of sins mentioned in there. People were really openly practicing it we live in a time in history i can choose whatever gender that i want to identify with even christians are buying into it even our christian friends are telling us if we oppose them how bad we are they're canceling us they are they're they're abandoning us supposed to be Christians, supposed to be Bible-believing Christians. And so you see what is happening today, right? We fear to send our children to uh, these schools. We fear what's going to happen to our young ones as they grow. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, if you and I begin to do things that you and I think is right. 
That is what our children are going to learn. And they're going to do what they think is right. And the society and culture teaches them that. Therefore, we as parents, we as church members, we as leaders, not just say we believe in God's word, live out that, live it out in a way that is effective and that is uh, 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 powerful to change people's minds and thinking. Sexual sins are uh, so common in our society today. Because of internet, because of things, we have all kinds of uh, problems. I don't know how many genders we have, how many uh, sex identities we want to have. And so we live in a time where this is Judges, Book of Judges. I will do what I want to do. I think right is what I think is right. So the consequences, one, is the distortion of true worship of God. Second is sexual distortion or distortion of sexuality. And then the third one, uh, very quickly, is the destruction of unity among the brethren. Destruction of unity among the brethren. So as you can see, you can move along in Judges chapter 20 and 21. It's a big problem. The man has done something to his concubine who had died. And the whole Israel is shocked what has happened. They try to go to the tribe of Benjamin. They try to explain to their brother how horrible things were. And they wanted to have punishment for those people who did that. These are amongst brothers, right? One of the tribes of Israel. Benjamin and tribe of Benjamin, they do not want to listen to the rest of the tribes. As a result, that unity, that oneness that God wanted, that God desired, is going to fall apart. So you, if you read the story, you know the rest of the story, they end up going to battle. And it just so happens that so many of them are killed. In that day, we're told 25,000 men died. And then they continued to pursue them, continue to kill them. They were almost distinct. And so we're told that at the end of chapter 21 and all that, it's like, oh, we have a problem now. One of our own brothers is no longer going to be around this world. We're going to completely destroy them. We got to do something to save it. And so we know the story that they want to save these 400 Benjamites that were alive. And they want to, again, restart that tribe. Otherwise, it would have been uh, uh, gone. So here we see the whole process has brought such division amongst God's people. It's not just division. It's war. It's battle. And, 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 and again, uh, the consequences of that is so evil. In the, old, in the New Testament, we're, we're reminded by God's word so many times that divisions, wars, and, and battles, they'd never come from God, right? Amongst God's children. And so it is Satan, it is divisive. He wants to destroy God's work, and he will do whatever he can do to bring division because in division there is no strength and churches are facing these kinds of things again according to the book of judges these three main things that we see as problematic in the book of judges is seen today in our own world in our own churches in our own families when we choose to do what I want to do and ignore God, there's a problem. The, the wisdom of this world is against God. Why should we listen to the idea, ideology and philosophy of this world that will ultimately take us away from God? We might want to bring some business ideas into the church. Church is not a business. 
right? We may want to do certain things that works for somebody else, but church is different. And so we see our churches, churches that I've been part of, have suffered a lot when there are congregants or there are believers. They're set in their own ways, regardless of what the Word of God teaches. Will introduce these kinds of tragedies, these kinds of sins to God's people. And this morning, my challenge for you as a church is to do what is right in God's sight. Study God's word and do not rationalize or do not reason and find ways to do your own thing. If the scripture tells you to do certain things, that's what it says. But because the world teaches us to reason with it and question God's word and don't believe it and, and know it, that's not the world we live in. And we put aside God's word and begin to do what our wise, we think we're wise, and we begin to do things on our own. And that just leads us to the path of destruction. So, brothers and sisters in the Lord, this morning, my uh, uh, challenge for you is be a church. Be a follower of Christ that loves God's word, that feeds you every day, and that you don't find any deviant ways to uh, ignore, to disobey God's word. You like a little child, desiring that fresh milk, desiring God's word, knowing so much of God's word, you are not easily driven out like the wind uh, and, and pushing you this way, that way. But God's word is mighty. God's word is true. And taking a stand on this in this culture, in this society, is what we need. Not molding into the shape of this world, but molding into what God has written in his word. Secondly, my challenge for you would be seek God's forgiveness. We have done things wrong. We have chosen foolish things. Here in the book of Judges, Israelites would sin, God would bring judgment, punishment, they would repent, and God would restore his relationship with his people. And what an opportunity for us to search our own heart as you celebrate the Lord's table. We come to communion service to self-examine. We come to communion service to see if I'm living that gospel that we Believe in what God has done. He died on the cross for our sins. He took my sin. He died on the cross for my sins. He has saved me. Lord, am I living that gospel day to day? It's an opportunity for you to come as you take uh, uh, bread and juice. It's a constant reminder, isn't it? It's not just a tradition we do. It is something that says, am I representing these elements the way God would be honored and glorified? And so it's a time to come and seek your heart and ask God's forgiveness and restore that relationship and begin to serve him again tomorrow, all week long, all month long, right? And so it is a challenge for us, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I know we live in a very, very hard uh, uh, time. And yet we have no excuses. All through the centuries, God's people have dealt with the same thing all the time. Sometimes we may say, it, it, probably it was not as bad as what we have today, right? We think that the worst is today. I don't, I don't know. God's people throughout the history have suffered from all kinds of persecution, all kinds of pressures. But thank God that we have this word of God preserved for us from centuries, and Christianity, faith in God, the things that are uh, um, uh, wonderful for us, saved till now. 
And it is our duty to go forward with the same kind of perseverance, same kind of uh, strength, and same kind of power that God allows us to give. So let me pray for the word of God we just heard. And I ask the Lord would uh, speak to your heart. Let me pray. Father God, I want to again thank you for this opportunity to come together and study God's word. Lord, as we come, we examine our heart. Lord, we belong to you. I belong to you. And my desire is to do what you would want me to do. Forgive me of my selfishness. Forgive me for the times when I have only thought of myself. Forgive me for the pride that I have always exalted myself. I have taken glory away from you. But thank you, Father, there is forgiveness in you. Thank you, Father, that you are always in the business of restoring people to yourself. So, Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters in the church there in Oregon. Continue to watch over them. Continue to bless them. Take them to newer heights, not because we have new ideas or cleverness. Take them to places that the church has never been because they trust you and they trust your word. Continue to bless them as they have many needs. Continue to provide for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.